All right, so welcome back to FDM Academy's YouTube channel. Here we are interviewing Paul Longjevin, uh, who is currently practicing OMM FDM in the military. He'll get into the details on that. But I wanted to welcome Paul and uh, get started by just hearing about your, your background and where you are right now. Uh, great. Um, so my name is Paul Longevin. I am in the United States Navy. I, um, I'm currently stationed at Naval Air Station Whidbey Island in Washington State. Um, I work for a couple of squadrons and uh, what we call wings. The wings own the squadrons, so a group of squadrons form a wing. Uh, so I'm the wing surgeon, so I manage a lot of their medical um, I don't work for Navy medicine per se, even though I'm a Navy physician. Uh, and needless to say, everything in this conversation is my opinion and not that of the United States Navy or Bureau of Medicine and Surgery from the United States Navy. Um, so this is my, I just uh, took this job prior to this. I was a senior medical officer on the USS Nimitz. And before that, I was a battalion surgeon with the uh, United States Marine Infantry, uh, 2nd Battalion, 3rd Marines out of Hawaii. So um, I'm a 2001 graduate of Oklahoma State, and I've been doing manipulation pretty much since the beginning of medical school, so uh, quite 23 years now. So. so in the military, I'm sure you have to, you can't just do OMM. It's just a piece of your practice. That's correct. They don't, uh, there's no really recognition of the specialty of OMM and, and you're not going to really set up a practice that is strictly OMM. Um, so it depends on your specialty and what you do. I'm actually in aerospace medicine and uh, preventive medicine and occupational medicine, but uh, being in a position of leadership, I'm able to actually carve out time where the, where I schedule just nothing but OMM because that's that's true, my true passion. So, Yeah, I, here in Fairbanks, I'm able to see patients, both Army and Air Force, and we mm -hmm. get referrals off right. base because generally they don't allow the provider as much time to perform manual medicine. Is that same thing in the Navy? Um, it, it really depends on where you are. Uh, again, it's going to be king because I kind of make my own schedule. And so I force that upon them. But as generally in the Navy, it really depends on you, where you are and your type of practice. I know some family practitioners who are able to really carve out some time and the clinic allows them to. It really depends on your commands, uh, who runs the hospital and kind of your position. Uh, I've found the Navy to be very open to it as long as it doesn't, doesn't interfere with other aspects of medicine. But the, the, what we call it, so you have the, the medical community and then you have the, the line community. Those are your pilots, your, 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 the guys that drive the ships and the commanding officers. That, and we call that the line community. And that's true for all the services. The line loves it. When they find out that you do, that you do OMM, it really, because they, they know it's effective. Um, the, the sailors, the Marines, soldier, airmen, they love it. And so they they really push for it. So if, if you can do it, you're always going to be busy, but you're right. Some places they get really, really busy. Or um, like we talked about before we started recording, some go off of RVUs, even though it's not a, it's not a reimbursement in the military. They just want to see workload. Right. And if you're spending 20, 30 minutes with a person, that's a low RVU for the amount of time. So, so they, they, okay, just start cranking through the people. You can't do that. And I've seen in, uh, in other things like, uh, um, they would train a lot of people to do acupuncture, which takes a lot of time, but they need to get back to their clinic and they won't let them do it. So it was, it was, it was, it was, it's, it's kind of difficult. Um, so sometimes you just need to carve out a little bit of your own time, but you know, especially FDM, it's so fast, so effective. You're not needing, you don't need 30, 45 minutes. You can do it in a 15, 20 minute appointment. So if, if you do it right, you should be able to, you should be able to, uh, practice, um, pretty complete with FDM. Yeah. So how did you get interested and in exposed to the FDM? So uh, interesting story. Back when I was a medical student, back in 1999, I was at a convocation. And I actually, uh, during the um, breakouts, when you, not breakout sessions, but uh, when, you, when you go with all the, uh, where all the uh, tables are set up, uh -huh. I actually met Dr. Stephen Topaldos. He was at a table selling his book. And 
I don't think he had a lot of traffic because as soon as I asked questions, I was sitting down and I went through an hour. He, he kind of gave me an hour lesson of, of what he does. So I got one of his books and um, it kind of started from there, but it's very piecemeal. I really did not understand the concept at that, at that stage. Um, and to integrate it or to, and this is gonna sound horrible, to integrate it in OMM was very difficult for me because I really had no, no mentorship uh, for that. And then I got back and I got in the Navy, I was a flight surgeon and I really couldn't break free to go, go learn it somewhere else where it should be the other, uh, other way around. OMM integrated into FDM and then expand it from there. Right, I opinion, but no. totally agree, totally agree. Uh, so what do you think about the FDM and you already alluded to it a little bit, but the FDM in the military, what do you see as its role? I see it as really a very powerful tool to, to help people in all aspects of, of military medicine. Um, I've practiced medicine in the middle of Romania, <laughs> in the middle of uh, the deserts, in, in, on the DMZ in uh, Korea. I've, I've done it in, in the mountains in, you know, with the Marines. And you don't get a lot, to, you don't have the opportunity to bring a lot of stuff with you. You know, especially in the Navy and Marine Corps, they don't give us a lot of stuff. You, sometimes it's just, okay, here's a backpack of stuff, go. So I don't need to carry anything for FDM. Yeah, we use some, some tools, but you can do 99.9% .9 of it with just your hands. The tools make it easier, but you don't absolutely need them. You know, the plungers and all that other stuff. You use your hands. And so these are always going to be with me no matter where I am in the world. And it's fast and it's effective. And I've used it a lot. And and it's been from everything from uh, somebody who's had an acute issue to that person that's been passed around from specialist to specialist. And just last, just this last week, I had I had one of those guys. Yeah, I've had sh I've had shoulder pain for eight years, is shoulder arthritis, and uh, I've seen so many people for it. Oh, okay, so what can't you do? Well, I can't do push-ups. I can't do this. And you just list a laundry list of stuff. And 10 minutes later, he's doing push-ups on the floor. He's like, yeah, I haven't done this in eight years, yeah. you know? And, you know, he's 36. Who called him? Who said he had arthritis at 36 years old, you know? So it's, it's very powerful in the military. And, and he was just blown away. And so, and, I, and as I said, I just got there. So I expect my schedule to get really full here shortly as soon as he starts talking to people, so. Yeah, with my experience with the military, you get a lot of people who've tried to, bunch of different things and they they are they're either on profile for a long period of time which means from mm -hmm. my knowledge you can't be deployed which basically is the unemployment line in the military and uh yeah you you can really make some significant changes i have a i have a security a cyber security gentleman right now who hadn't been able to run in years and has recently been able to start running again because he's mm -hmm. his legs don't hurt you know and so to to get the in my experience the people who want to be in the military want to get better the people who don't want to be yeah. in the military they're on their way out anyway and you're not going to fix them but those who want to be in there and stay in there they really respond very well to the treatment yes and and they're they're completely blown away um one how quick it is and then two really how thorough and complete the the effects of it are um i've had i've had pilots you know especially in the navy landing on an aircraft carrier hundreds if not thousands of times is a is a <laughs> dynamic shock to the body to say the least and so you'll have these people who are who are just beat up from landing and launching from the aircraft carrier and so, you know, and this is quite a few of them. Yeah, I've had back pain just off and on for a good 10 years. This is the first time I had no back pain. So yeah, it's, it's, it's just amazing. And they're completely blown away. Is there something you find typical in those pilots? A lot of HTPs, lots of CDs, especially around the, uh, the posterior aspect of the iliac crest right there. Lots and lots of CDs. Uh, I even had a couple of um, uh, inverted CDs that are kind of deep there and you got, you got to have to mess with it until you get in that right vector and then uh, that release and they will tell you when that thing releases. It's usually a gasp of this is awesome. I've never felt this good. <laughs> so um, 
So those are typically what I see is, is, is just that pattern of, of stuff. And a lot of glutes, a lot of bullseyes. Oh yeah. Um, Cause they're just sitting in those seats and those seats are old and they're worn out. And, it, and as I said, it's a very dynamic process landing and launching from an aircraft carrier. Gene Leonard and I were teaching in San Diego uh, one course and we had a lady who was married to a Navy SEAL and uh, he, he came in at the end of Saturday, you know, so it's usually Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And he came in mm-hmm. and he, he didn't look particularly, you know, he wasn't the Hollywood Navy SEAL guy. He was just an average looking guy. And he, he said he had neck pain, likely from his night vision. And then he also had some knee pain. Mm-hmm. And so we treated his neck and then had a minute. So I treated his knee and he, they left because they were actually running to the uh, premiere of a Navy SEAL, SEAL movie that had been embedded in their unit. And uh, okay. so I didn't really get to you know, follow up. He just was like, yeah, that was great. Thanks. And he left. So I, you know, chalked it up as a treatment that wouldn't make much difference. And then the next morning there was seven seals standing outside (laughs) the uh, (laughs) room waiting to be treated. So I think it was pretty effective. Like I I work with some uh, DOs now and they do some OMT clinic and they just don't get the results that, that, that I get from doing FDM and placing everything in the model. I still do a little bit of muscle energy. I still do a lot of counter strain, which still in my mind fits, fits in the model. It's more of a folding unfolding. And in, in, in this is just me putting the three dimensional model together in my head. I think strain counter strain is, is a powerful unfolding and folding technique. Um, and, and that's the biggest thing to, for that, that I learned from FDM is the, yes, we're listening. To, this is an assumption that we're listening to the patients and, and they're, the, they're the masters, but then the application, what we need to put it in is that sequence of, of, of treatments. And I think that's where, you know, where most of osteopathic manipulation gets it wrong is, okay, I find this, okay, do muscle energy. Okay, do HVLA. Okay, do fascial release. Okay, do this. Whereas, you know, take care of those painful, painful things first and then asking the right questions of the patient and then listening to the response in the FDM model really makes it much more powerful. And that's, that's kind of what I've been kind of working on in my head for, for quite some time now. Yeah. For me that, you know, that began when I first started training for the instructor's exam, I saw the power of making it part of OMM and OMM a part of FDM. It's just with the, I mean, anybody can do FDM that has the medical background. So athletic trainers, um, chiropractors, all these people, physical therapists are very good at FDM, but that toolkit of having that full scope of osteopathic manipulation to me is mind blowing. It's, that's the piece that when you have confidence in the model, you gain so much more confidence in the other modalities. And one of my favorite things to do is I went back and looked at all my lectures and stuff from undergraduate med school and went through it again because it made such a difference in my outlook on a lot of these treatments. For counter strain, not only do I think of it as foldings, I also think of it as the HCPs. Um, you know, so okay. there, there's some elements that you can, HVLA is very much unfolding and refolding. I call it the fourth dimension of HVLA. That, that <laughs> That's the art of HVLA is how do you get that little that extra movement. So yeah, I, I totally agree that OMM component to me makes it, it's why it can be fast. You know, I take 15 minute appointments for four hours every morning and that's, that's how you can do that. Otherwise you have to have these hour long appointments that I'm sure wouldn't work in the military, much less corporate medicine. Not at all. Yeah. It's, it's, it's one of those things that, uh, once you start getting into the rhythm of it and cause there was some transition time from going from the, from my aircraft carrier to this clinic. And then uh, it only took me literally just one because I've been doing this so long. It took me, uh, there was a good month and a half that I was off not doing any clinic at all. Just, you know, checking in, getting the computer system and all this stuff. Uh, cause literally half my time is only clinic. The other half is administrative and command stuff. Um, so I'm still doing the flight physicals and all that stuff. But then when I was able to ramp up, it only took me real, really one clinic day to get used to the FDM again. And uh, it just comes back so quick once you've been doing it this long. Yeah. What do you see the advantages of FDM other than the speed in the military? Um, just its dynamic application of, 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 as I said earlier, you can, you can do this anywhere. You're not, you're not, um, you're not relegated to doing this 
in a clinic on a table that's meant for this. I've done manipulation on the ground in the middle of nowhere and it's just, you can apply it, okay? I don't really fall out and twisted an ankle, it hurt, okay? Take off his stuff, take a look at him, people are still going. Uh, you, normally you just throw them in the, in the Humvee and they ride along, okay? And it's a kind of a, it's kind of a ride of shame for them. So they don't want to be there. Yeah, five, 10 minutes and that guy's running up to them. Some of them that don't want to march, you know, are kind of upset that you've fixed them, but the vast majority are okay with that. And so, um, you know, they, they just, they just hit the trail and they're, they're hiking again. They're, they're moving. So it's that you're able to reverse, uh, some, some issue and then get them going quickly. Um, there are stories of the first Gulf war of, of pilots landing. And this is air force and, and, and Navy pilots landing, getting out of the aircraft. And literally there's all men tables right on the side of the runway because they're landing, fueling, loading, launching. So you have maybe 20, 30 minutes. So they would literally do manipulation on them right there on the side of the runway. They get on the aircraft, do a pre quick pre-flight and off they go. Um, so it's just the application can be anywhere. And that's the beauty of it. And again, this is all you need, really. You don't, you don't need other stuff. So. You would almost think there would be some research from their utilization perspective. Um, I mean, Josh Boucher, who's in the Army, he, he did the heel pain study that should be published pretty soon. Um, and the average length of profile for plantar heel pain was like 400 days. And he was able to get these people off profile. You know, you, you would think it wouldn't take too much effort to show the effectiveness of getting that pilot back in the cockpit flying. And, you know, whether they're able to stay in the air or you would think that every, I mean, the amount of money these guys cost to train, you would think you'd have a DO with the OMM toolkit standing on every flight deck. Yeah, you, you would think, um, and uh, big banner of this is Paul's opinion, military medicine is still a bureaucracy. You know, they, um, it, 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 it's, it's still pretty difficult to, to navigate and, and, and try to do things like that. Um, and then moving those DOs that, that you, you know, frankly, most DOs don't do manipulation. So right. you gotta find those that do it and that apply it. Um, so, and I get that asked all the time. So uh, I'm transferring soon, who else can do this? And I'm like, unfortunately in the Navy, I think I'm the only person that does this. So, um, so, so, so that, that's, that, that's the painful part of it in my, in my brain is, you know, you could turn around so many people quickly, um, but the bureaucracy is just is just a difficult beast to, to to fight. Yeah, definitely. I had the opportunity to meet the gentleman who pushed forward the battlefield acupuncture um, in the army, uh, and we met over a lunch. And he actually said, "Todd, you should be able to repeat all of the studies and all of the information, and just submit it using FDM in place of the word acupuncture." Um, yeah. Obviously, I think you'd have to be in the military to do that, and I'm not in that position. But uh, I don't know the battlefield application of FDM, but I could definitely. It doesn't take much to imagine a sprained ankle being treated. I think because I do, I do auricular acupuncture, and BFA is 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 just one of the many ones that I do. Um, and we can talk about that if you want to, because I had a very cool case this uh, um, this this uh, last week, um, but. But that, that's at, there, I could see more applications for FDM than I would acupuncture. And I do both. Oh. But FDM is what, I, is what I do most of the time. So yeah, if you could do, F, if you could do battlefield acupuncture, you could do, you could do FDM and more in more, in more situations. One of the questions that came up at that point when we were talking is you'd have to be willing and ready to train the medics and in my experience a lot of those medics are pretty pretty capable highly trained and it wouldn't be a big stretch to get their you know their ability to think and work in the model uh didn't seem like it'd be a tough situation no i think i think um you could take like in in the navy we have what's called independent duty corpsmen and these are usually a little bit more senior corpsmen who've demonstrated that they have the um the educational acumen and the drive to go through this course and it's a pretty rigorous course it's about a year long 
and they come out and they can prescribe certain medications, they can do certain procedures, and they, they work, as, as the title says, independently when they need to. So like if you look at the destroyers and frigates in the Navy, those don't have doctors, those have independent duty corpsmen. And so, and so they'll call up to the, the, the senior medical officer and the carrier. So like all my destroyers, we don't have frigates anymore. We just have destroyers and cruisers now. And they have independent uh, uh, duty corpsmen. And so they'll call me up and they, will, and they will present a case if they get stuck. But for the most part, they work very independently. And I have, and I have two IDCs um, on the carrier that also work for me. And so most of them, like if you come to work to, for me as IDC, First thing you're going to learn is you're going to learn um, uh, 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 battlefield acupuncture and auricular acupuncture because I'm just going to you're just going to get it. You have to do it if you work for me um, because I can legally credential them to do that. I can't legally credential them to do any kind of ma manipulation, and that's a, that's a sad thing because the vast majority of them are very capable. If they take a week, if they take a um, a module. Yeah. They would be doing it uh, Monday, just like a PA or nurse practitioner or a physician would. Easy. Yeah, it seems like something that we would have to uh, str strategize and come up with a plan on how we could implement that. And then the funding of it is always the next thing. You know, it's how do you get yeah. it implemented on into their program. But I think it's, you know, for our active duty, it sure seems like it would be a, a viable alternative. Yeah, in my opinion, that, that would be that would be a, um, uh, a very useful tool for them as well. Yeah, and as we look through our roster of uh, AFDMA practitioners, we have more and more military coming on board, and that's always exciting. We've talked about, in addition to the AFDMA study group, doing an AFDMA military study group or a military connection sometime, just so you guys who struggle with that bureaucracy that the rest of us don't understand, you could have a uh, kind of a chat board, what do you do in this case, and um, how yeah. do you deal with yeah, it shouldn't be too hard. And I think the same people who moderate the AFDMA study group should be able to set it up. So maybe the next time we get to better together, we can actually try to get that accomplished. You're, you're nearing retirement, correct? Yes. Yes, I am. 18 months. <laughs> so Who's we'll be, counting? Who's counting? <laughs> yeah, 17 months, 16 days. And so what are your plans when your, your career with the Navy is over? So uh, run away from bureaucracies as much as possible. So <laughs> um, uh, I, I believe I'm, uh, and still gotta hash this out, how, uh, hash this out with uh, my wife, but um, right now probably head back towards Wyoming. Okay. And I just, I, I'm 100% OMM and a little bit of auricular acupuncture. Um, Cause I, I found that the two really go well together. Um, I, I'm trained in traditional acupuncture I can't do the hour appointment. It takes a long time, but the auricular acupuncture, literally two, three, four, five minutes, the, the needles can be in. Uh, you don't have to worry about them taking them out with the techniques I use. And that in combination with the FDM is such a powerful tool. So probably a private practice, just a solo private practice. Um, and then teach, teach, teach. And then as I, I think I've told you, I'm working on, uh, well, I'm pretty much done uh, with my auricular acupuncture course that I can, that I want to start teaching. So FDM teaching, auricular acupuncture teaching, and just private practice and lots of biking and hiking. So what type of things does the auricular ac acupuncture kind of combine well with the FDM? So, um, so I had, I had a perfect case uh, and I'm sure you've seen plenty of patients like this. They, they, because pain is a very heavy, it's a very um, heavy sympathetic driver. It drives a sympathetic tone very, very hard. And for some people, they can't handle that tone. So this, uh, this one gal, she came in, she's been having off and on back pain for two years, but this, this, lat this latest uh, um, iteration of back pain for the past three weeks have just fired her up. And she came in and she's just like, her body language was like, okay, show me where it hurts everywhere. Okay. Well, can, can you point to something? Can you move? She's like, and she'd literally just go like this to her back. And he's like everywhere. The auricular acupuncture, whether it's uh, BFA, whether, and there's other, there's other techniques outside of just the battlefield acupuncture. There's a, there's an anxiety driven one. There's uh, one for nausea, motion sickness. And there's, there's, so I've really expanded on what I do with that, but literally two, three needles in, and these are very small, what we call semi-permanent needles. 
her, it really brought her sympathetic tone down. And she's like, oh, it hurts right here. <laughs> so, you know, she went from this heavy sympathetic tone who couldn't describe anything to, oh, wow, yeah, I'm moving much better. Yeah, it hurts right here. And then her body language is perfect. And she walked out, she's like, okay, I'm good. So that makes, so, that makes me think of treating basically cylinders that unable to identify that catastrophic, horrible pain with acupuncture by uh, impacting yes. the, the chemical drivers in the body. You know, what's fascinating about that to me is our patients are always wondering why they are the way they are. And a lot of the times mm -hmm. we answer, we don't know, you know, it can be diet, it can be stress, you know, it's these hormones floating around in the body. And a lot of the time that's what's causing the issue. So this is, I just had a lady the other day who I was basically unable to touch and uh, I had to do some stuff to get the cylinders out of her body with some cupping. Um, that would be an amazing tool to have in the quiver to, because I already do dry needling in the more, much more acupuncture style where you just stick them in, leave them and let them incubate. Um, so, you know, mm -hmm. the, that would be a, not a difficult issue. So you got to get that course up and running. And as soon as you do, we should uh, make sure people know about it and, Maybe we can get a project yeah, going on. Yeah, so, cylinders. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so with this gal, you put the needles in and it's almost instantaneous. So it was literally two needles in and the vat, this, this, this wild beast of pain was now focused to where she could tell me where things were. And it was, it was less than two minutes and I started doing FDM. So that's, that's kind of the tool that it is. Had you I ever need seen her the before? needles to sit there and go for that was my first visit. Yeah, some people struggle with that initial visit in implementing FDM. Personally, I I don't. Um, I think a lot of it is the reputation of our our clinic, but I think patients are ready to be better. So if you explain to them it's going to hurt a little yes. bit, most people are like, "Fine, that that won't bother me." Yeah, I've I've never really run into that. I, and I've heard I'm the same way. I've heard that from quite a few other people, but it's I don't know if it's just my matter of fact way of doing things, but. People come to me to get better and I'm going to work my best to help them get better. And, and, and they know that and they accept it. And then we just move on with the treatment. I think our own confidence in whatever we're doing, whether it's, you know, FDM, OMM, surgery, injections, though, it's the way you sell it. A lot of the times, you know, you say, I really believe yeah. this is going to help you because you fundamentally believe that. And the patient picks up on that. If you're much more hesitant about, well, you know, this might help. It could cause some pain. I don't think you're going to get the buy-in, but the more we get our, our confidence in whatever model we're working in, I think the patients feed off of that. There's definitely that interaction with our, with our own confidence. And I, I completely agree. Even with the auricular acupuncture or just regular acupuncture, I was, I was, a, I was a little bit timid in the beginning, like, eh, you know, and I'm like, why am I doing that? I know what I'm doing. And just, 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 you know, Hey, we're going to try this. And I caveat, you know, nothing's a hundred percent. You know, and, and, and there's, only, there's not a lot of studies on the type of, acu uh, well, no, there's actually quite a few studies on auricular acupuncture. About 15% of the people do not respond. And I tell them this, hey, you know, you may just be not one of those non-responders, but if it helps you, you're going to really like this. So, yeah, it sounds like we're coming up with several projects that you get to work on in your retirement. Maybe we can connect and, yes. and uh, get another course going. That sounds like, uh, you know, sometimes we get some freedom at the AAO uh, convocation. And I think uh, an element of auricular acupuncture as part of that presentation would be spectacular. Yeah. Yeah. And my course is literally a four hour course and you can start doing this in your office. It's not, it's not a long course. It's not difficult. In the face it's, of COVID, any it's chance it's going to be online? Uh, it could be. It, yeah, it could be. It could be. Yeah. That might be the way you to, just go. Have to get material. Before. Yeah, yeah, that's, it might be. As I'm uh, the next few months, I'm going to be spending a lot of time trying to get a lot of the content of our pro programs online, um, you know, but you can't learn FDM without hands on, but you can get a lot of the backstory and maybe we can shorten the time that we have to be away from our own clinics or families. Um, one of the plans I'm hoping is that we could do some online content and local table trainers, people who are qualified and skilled enough mm -hmm. to be table trainers. So various cities, we could actually do a um, like uh, uh, 
group course, but in five different cities all at the same time. Time zones would be navigable, yeah. but yeah, that's one of my hopes. 